Hi, I'm Steve Addison, and uh, today I'm going to be talking to Troy Cooper about uh, what he's learning uh, regarding how to multiply disciples and churches. So, Troy, how did, how did you get into this whole area of, um, I guess, movements that, that see new disciples, new churches mm -hmm. formed? What, what's, how'd, you, how'd you step into it? Well, I was serving as an associate pastor at a church for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. And for 10 of those 12 years, I was mentored in movement principles by a missionary named Steve who our church supported. Okay. And Steve had catalyzed movements in Asia in a closed country. And uh, every time he was home, he would just pour into me uh, these principles and we would meet over Skype. We called it discipleship. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking all this in and, and beginning to, to think movement, uh, but I just, I didn't see it really translating into our context in the U.S. I'm like, well, that'll be great one day when I go overseas, but okay. uh, I don't know of anybody doing this kind of thing in the U.S. And uh, so I, I didn't really put it into practice at all. So what moved you from getting the ideas and yeah. sort of grounding it in, in every day? Yeah. Well, I went on a missions trip in 2011 and with him and saw movement with my own eyes. I saw lives transformed, I saw whole households, villages transformed, and I saw what was going on being led by local leaders that had been raised up from the movement. And it blew my mind. I mean, it, it brought me to a, a point of worship where I was just celebrating mm. what God was doing. But as I'm looking back on our 12 years of ministry, what I saw brought me to a point of deep conviction that I was disobeying Jesus' great commission because we had almost zero impact on lostness. Uh, we were seeing uh, people grow in their faith and, mm. and grow in Christ and stay in their faith after high school and college, but we were hardly seeing anybody come to Christ. And so I felt like, man, I'm disobeying the great commission. And what really crushed me was the students and their families that were following me were disobeying Jesus because they were following me. So I, I just repented and cried out to the Lord and he, he forgave me and instructed me to just go do what you know to do now. So what did that look like when yeah. you went and did what you're supposed, yeah. what you knew to do? Well, I went, I went back to Indianapolis, our home, and just began to uh, put into practice what I knew. I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I think up to that point I had been building relationships with people, uh, but I, I needed to get to the gospel was the bottom line. So you had a lot of connects. Yeah. with all sorts of people who were far from God, yeah. but you weren't getting to the gospel. That's right. So how did that change? Well, I just started getting to the gospel with people. Um, with Starting with some neighbors, uh, we began looking at the Bible together and, and really um, taking them to the gospel. And we saw immediate fruit. We saw two couples that had adultery in their marriages uh, come to faith and reconcile. And so we saw something start in our neighborhood. Well, how did you jump from, I'm not really doing this stuff, and all of a sudden you've got people who have come to Christ and you're in the Bible. How did you get from, you know, how are you today, to yeah. do you want to read the Bible together? Yeah. Well, um, well, I had the relationships already there. We okay. started with people that we knew. Yeah. And so the relationships were there. And, um, and one day I literally just said, hey, would you be interested in studying the Bible? And okay. they said yes. At the time, we didn't have a, uh, a gospel tool outside of looking at the Bible together. So we just invited, uh, I actually read a statistic uh, in Ed Stetzer's book, Lost and Found, that 61% of lost people who wouldn't go to church would study the Bible with a friend. And actually, if you read it further, 89% who wouldn't go to church would listen to somebody tell them about their faith. Wow. And, so, and did you do this in, in the couple's home or in your home? Well, we did, we did it in our home. We were hanging out with people yeah. and I said, hey, I heard this stat, are you guys, you don't go to church, would you be interested in studying the Bible? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, wow. really? And uh, I said, well, when would you guys want to do it? They're like, it was a Tuesday. They're like, Thursday. So wow. um, we had 14 people in our living room two days later and half of them I didn't know. And, and my wife and I look at each other like, what are we doing? And so, um, but God used it. And we saw people come to Christ and we began to see it multiply. We didn't have a vision for church. You know, it was, it was still a group at that time, but um, God began to multiply the kingdom through those families in our neighborhood. Okay, what was the next sort of step or stage in, in your journey towards movements? 
Well, I think outside of the neighborhood, I began to see, you know, I, was, I was a student pastor and discipleship pastor, so I saw students begin to multiply. I mean, we had one guy that saw fourth generation disciples starting with his cross country team within um, a couple months. So generation is like a, a new disciple, disciple has led made someone disciple, to Christ. Made a disciple. They had discipleship groups meeting. They were worshiping to Lecrae. You know, it was, it was awesome. It was just multiplying all over. Uh, we saw, I, I taught a parenting class and I just started to train them how to make disciples. I saw one woman um, multiply to three generations, uh, starting with her family and a neighbor, a friend and a neighbor and her husband led a bunch of guys from a fire department to Christ and, uh, and then uh, was, um, started just training anybody that would be interested. That was so it, just started training broadly. You're not just broadly. doing this, but you're training oh, yeah. people as you're learning the simple skills oh, of yeah. how to connect, share the gospel, and then mm -hmm. sit down and read the Bible with That's people right. who want to know more. That's right. And um, how to disciple the fruit. You know, how do you begin discipling people who come to faith and, and try to push into their oikos or their sphere of influence? Their oikos, their relational network. Uh -huh. That's okay. Right. So you're, you're sort of applying now all these principles that were floating around in your head. Yeah. I, I imagine Steve, your friend in, in uh, Southeast Asia, is thinking, finally, after 10 years, he's doing something. <laughs> well, it's funny because you invest in the obedient and I wasn't doing anything, but the Lord told him in a dream to invest in me. And so that's the only reason he persisted wow. with me. And I know Steve, so it's a miracle <laughs> he persisted without know, you doing I anything. Know. Okay. So now stuff's happening. You're seeing yeah. not just someone praying a prayer, you're seeing people turning to Christ, getting forgiven. I guess you're baptizing them mm -hmm. and they're going into discipleship straight away. Yeah. And the gospel's moving through relational networks. That's right. Okay. Was there a next stage in your whole journey? Yeah, I think at that point I discovered um, that I was an apostolic you know, little a apostolic leader that was stuck in a shepherding role. Okay. And um, the Lord transitioned us into more of a full-time catalytic role. So uh, we ended up um, accepting an invitation to go serve in Japan for a year and train some Japanese churches and some missionaries there. A guy named David Servanka, who's, who's catalyzing movement in Tokyo now. Um, and we saw, we didn't see churches multiply, but we saw disciples multiply in Japan. Wow. And uh, so it just confirmed in us, okay, this is something, God, your harvest is, uh, this is true. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, uh, and it's a matter of just releasing the kingdom and obeying what Jesus said, told us to do. Okay. So, so you went to Japan, and then, and again, so in a cross-cultural setting, and a very hard field. Yeah. Japan, historically, is tough. Yeah. You're seeing it happen. Next stage in the journey. What was next? Well, while we're in Japan, the Lord really, um, uh, two things really happened. Number one was he told us, he showed us that he wanted to use the whole family. At that okay. point, it was just me. Yeah. And uh, he, he showed me through my children that he wanted to use our kids and my wife. Uh, and so just the fullness of that ministry as a family uh, was a huge shift. And the second thing. Before we move to this, what, what does that look like? God um, using your whole family. Ah, oh, it's awesome. Give, give us an example. Um, well, I mean, the easiest thing is to tell you how it started. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it wasn't my plan. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, I was supposed to go on a prayer walk, and um, and my wife's like, "Hey, why don't you take the kids with you?" I'm, I'm like, "I'm doing really important things here for God, like uh, childcare, really." And so, uh, but she's just like, "You know, I need a break." So I took the boys with me. And there were five and seven at the time. And I'm praying through the streets of Sapporo and my five-year-old just starts praying boldly, like, God, tear down these idols. And I'd never prayed those words before. Mm. And so I realized the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. Mm. And I, the identity I, I was casting for them was that God couldn't use them. Mm. And so I was withholding that from them. And the Holy Spirit was teaching me like, hey, you're holding them back. Like, I wanna use them. Like, mm. I'm in them, I wanna use them. And I thought, man, these guys are actually going to Japanese school with, so they know these kids. Mm -hmm. And so I just began to learn. And then we would move back to Indianapolis. I was doing a training and I had my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old with me. And um, we would send people out for practice and to go share the gospel. And they're like, dad, we wanna go share. 
Nine and seven. Nine and seven. I'm okay. like, I'm like, no, you guys are gonna like go start a cult or something. Like you're gonna get it wrong. Like I just, I couldn't see God using them in that way, and I didn't want to mess it up. And and they're like, Dad, we have to obey Jesus. I'm just like, oh, okay. So, I mean, so we go out and uh, we went to a, like a food court at a mall because it's like they're sitting ducks there. So it's easy to do like gospel engagement practice. So we go up to two people that rejected them and we get to the third person and it's this, this woman who's just finished her food. She's got two small children. And I'm thinking like, let's let this poor woman, you know, leave her alone. And, and Malachi, my seven year old, or yeah, seven year old goes, dad, we have to share with all, not some. I'm like, which I had just taught 30 minutes before. And um, so he starts up a gospel conversation with her, you know, just says, hi, I'm Malachi. And, uh, we're out talking to people about God. Do you have a couple minutes? And she said, I have been waiting for somebody to talk to me. Oh my. So he sits down and thinks it's normal and runs through the gospel with her and she repents and believes. And he's seven. Yeah, he was seven. He looked up to me, he goes, what do I do now, dad? You know, and it's, it's, I'm just marveling at how God is using him. And so it just confirmed in me, like, like I withholding their identity as yeah. an ambassador of Jesus. And so, he had to teach me that. and then we just had to slowly just start, you know, we're, we're applying what we learned and, and making disciples with our kids and God so started go to use them. Visiting in the community and your uh -huh. neighborhood and you just go as a family. That's right. Yeah, we'll go on prayer walks and sometimes, you know, with the little ones, they can't go as long. Yeah. Um, I don't force them ever when yeah. it comes to training. They have the option, but because they're practitioners and they make disciples and because they've started churches. Um, they, they're the best trainers. They keep it simple and they, their faith is immense yeah. because they see it here and they see it out there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. Now you're, you're both doing this now, mm -hmm. but you're broadly training as well. Not just your kids, but you're training anyone who, who, who will learn. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people, you, you might not, believe this, but a lot of people would look at Troy and say, well, he's, he's an extrovert and he's mm -hmm. unusual and all of that. Um, are you seeing the same sort of patterns just when, you know, ordinary folks who don't even feel like they can do these things and you train them, do you, do you see God using them as well? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I mean, I think we see people obeying Jesus where they're at. And um, like we saw one guy recently who came to a, a training. We live in South Florida now, God moved us there. Mm. He came to a training and um, just a real shy, introverted guy. And um, he was actually planning on skipping the evangelism practice time. I've been there. <laughs> and, uh, but when he went out, you know, we're, we go out in the harvest and we will never force somebody to do something. It's gotta be obedience to Jesus, but we find it really, like Jesus modeled for mm. people. He would, you know, he would go out and engage uh, homes and then he would send them out and have them go you know themselves and then debrief with mm -hmm. them so we do that we model for people uh, we practice and then we'll take them out in the harvest and model for them in the harvest mm -hmm. and then give them an opportunity to do it themselves well this guy Evan um, you know he was shy he was timid but he he goes out there and he sees it modeled then he does it himself he just discovers the joy of obedience and he actually literally stopped the guy on his bicycle to tell this guy about Jesus. Um, so, I, yeah, I've seen people who are introverted or shy or maybe feel like they're not, um, you know, the guy that can get up in front of a thousand people um, just radically obey Jesus and discover the joy in that. People of all ages, all backgrounds. So, <clears throat> I'm just thinking, you know, our audience says amongst them will be church planters or uh, existing church pastors mm -hmm. or the planted in the past and they're wanting to send folks out to plant again. They want to equip the people in their existing church to do this. Yeah. So as you've sort of gone this journey, yeah. what are you, where do you need to get started? What are some of the essential skills that, that every leader should be aiming to master uh -huh. and then to be able to train and release their people in, whether they're yeah. pastoring an existing church or out there church planting. Oh, what, what are just some of the, the, the essentials? Yeah. Well, again, I, I observe these in my children, but I'd say it, all, it starts with a deep abiding in Jesus, mm -hmm. that they're spending time in the Word, they're spending time in prayer, they have a, the Father's heart um, for the community, and God begins to expand 
their vision for what he wants to do. And um, that's the power. That's, I mean, just having the power of, of God's spirit and his word. Um, so it starts with abiding. And then I think one of the biggest challenges, if 98% of Christians in the U.S. don't share their faith, um, that's really where it starts. Mm -hmm. Is um, kind of like where I was stuck was I had all these relationships with people. So I was connecting, but I wasn't getting to the gospel. And I feel like sometimes we feel like we got to earn the right to share the gospel with people. But when we look at the scriptures, we don't see that. We see that they were out boldly sowing broadly. And I'm not an evangelist, Steve. Mm -hmm. I, I am... Uh, um, I have an, an apostolic gifting, but I'm not an evangelist. It's a lordship thing for me mm. to obey. And so I found having others come with me that are more evangelistic was really helpful. To okay. kind so of a good way myself. to get started is just say, let's, I'd like to, I like to hang out with somebody who's just used Absolutely. to doing this. Absolutely. And, and, and just, I'll, I'll go along and smile and pray. Yeah. Uh, that's literally what and I that, did. Yeah, and then that also helps. I, I picked one of these crazy evangelist yeah. guys that's like he shares with everybody, and I'm like, oh, please, not here. You know, my buddy Austin in Indianapolis, he, he took me out, and it, uh, I just watched what he did, and it was really uncomfortable for me, but it, uh, it gave me the, um, I, I felt more competent and confident to go engage, and, um, and yeah, now I've got my kids, obviously, so. Okay, and... They're going to need to learn just how to share a simple gospel outline. I think how to start a gospel conversation okay. is probably one of the biggest mm. challenges. Is how do you, you know, well, once people can get to the gospel. Give, give us an example of how you would okay. start a gospel conversation. Yeah. Um, I found this works among believers and or people you know and people that you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, my buddy Carter Cox came up with this, and it's just a simple question: Has anyone shared the gospel with you before? Okay. Okay, <laughs> and 100% of the time, uh, people are will respond. And so, like, let me practice with you. Yeah, Hi. Steve. Yeah, we've known each other for a while, and um, I just want to. Has anyone ever shared the gospel with you before? I don't think so. Okay, would you mind if I showed you a simple way? Sure. How, how okay. long will it take? Oh, just a couple of minutes. Sure. And so then, then you share. Decide. We use a one a tool called the three circles. Yeah. Um, but then if, like, say say uh, yes that you've heard it already. Yeah, I've heard it already. Has anyone ever showed you a simple way to share with others? Okay. And then you'll take them through the three circles, uh -huh. and that will help them understand what the gospel is, even if they, they think they know it, but they're not quite sure. That's right. Okay. So how to start the conversation, how to share a simple gospel presentation that's biblical so God can use it, but simple so it can reproduce. You know, like we see in John 4, the woman at the well immediately goes back to her mm -hmm. town. The demoniac in Mark 5, Jesus sends him back. Right? So we see examples of scripture, these people that immediately after following Jesus, God uses them to reach their community. So we want it to be simple. But then after that too, I think the follow-up, like what do you do once somebody says yeah. they want to follow Jesus? Like, I, I don't know about you, but there's been times You take where... them to the pastor or the, <laughs> <laughs> the church yes. service or whatever. Yeah, you, I remember. You pass that problem on. One time I was uh, in college and, and I got to lead a guy to Christ on a construction site. I was working a summer job and uh, um, he, he's, you know, he's looking at me like, what do I do now? And I'm like, I have no idea. I can't believe I just shared with you, let alone you believed. So I like, got him a big old Bible with his name on it. And I like, hey, good luck. Go find a church, you know. And so I, I didn't know what to do. And so having people know when somebody, you know, there's several responses to the gospel. that They know exactly what to do. You know, if they say no, if they say, mm, I'm, I'm kind of interested. Uh, or if they say, yeah, I'm interested. So what, okay, so you'll, you're training people in just simple ways to share the gospel, how yeah. to bridge into the gospel with people they know, people they don't know. Yeah. And you're also making sure that they know what to do next. That's right. So if it's, uh, I guess we say a red light, yeah. what, what happens? Ah, that's good. So in Acts 17, when Paul's at the Areopagus, um, it's, we see three responses. Uh, it said, others, uh, some said, some mocked, that's a red light, they reject the gospel. Some said, we'll hear you again about this, that's a yellow light. And so they're like, ah, I'm kind of interested, but I'm not ready to follow. And we usually invite them to Discovery Bible Study. And it says in verse 34, but some uh, joined him and believed, that's a green light. And so we immediately uh, begin discipleship with them, starting with, we, we take them to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21, and just set their identity. Say, look at verse 17, you're new. Mm. No matter what you've done or has been done to you, you're new. 
Now look at verse 21. It's because of Jesus' exchange. He traded all your sin for his righteousness. That's how you're made new. And the reason why is because he's on mission and you're now his ambassador. So we set that identity in Christ that they're an ambassador and we immediately ask them, who in your life needs to hear this? And so we get them thinking, oh, okay, people in my life, yeah. And, and then we'll have them practice sharing the gospel and then set up a time to meet. So you're training a brand new believer right. how to share That's with right. their friends and family. That's right. It's the, the first the, thing to have them. The first thing after they've turned right. to Christ. Because we want to see obedience to Jesus. And they've already seen the gospel share modeled because we just did it with them, right? And so that's an easy thing to have them obey. And we see biblical examples of believers right away going. So we, we have them practice and then we'll set up a time. We found that within the first 48 hours is important of, you know, when can we get together? On the, and we're shooting to, to meet in their area, you know, their home, their their place of, of where they're hanging out. When can we get together, or where can we get together? When can we get together in the next two days? And then lastly, who else do you want to invite? And and we used to ask, who else would want to come? And we saw, mm. we saw Christians were coming. So we're like, who else needs to come? Yeah. And so they're bringing their friends. And uh, my wife, this happened with my wife. She There was a, a waitress that we were, um, was prayed for by some friends of ours who were visiting. They just said, how can we pray for you? Um, and she, uh, they prayed for her, shared the gospel, and she was a yellow light. So they set up a time to meet with my wife. And my wife, um, and she brought a friend. And they both repented and believed, both were baptized, and they started a church. Um, and they chose to meet in, in his home. So, wow. yeah. So this is what, both what you're doing and training others to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so if, if someone's sort of thinking, well, guys, you just treat up this. You know, mm. you just, I, I'm writing it down, but I'm just getting little bits here and there. Yeah. Um, where, where can they go mm. just to, to, to make sure, okay, we know enough and can do this ourselves. Mm. Now we can begin training and mobilizing others on our team. Yeah. So what's, what's the, best, the best place to go get that? As far as a, a, a place to, of contact? Yeah, yeah, to get some further training. Um, I mean, we've just treetopped yeah. this. Highly recommend movements.net. It's a great blog <laughs> okay, um, sure. for as far as resources. But I mean, us personally, coopersonamission.com. Yeah. Uh, we've got resources there and a training schedule. Um, and then uh, No Place Left is, is the network, the broad network we're a part of. So there's a website, noplaceleft.net. Okay, noplaceleft.net. Mm -hmm. So you're training, but you have a whole network across the US. I'm, I'm and more, Canada. yeah. I'm more Canada, Britain, and, all right, and Canada. Milton okay. Bank. Yep. Um, so if if someone's listening to this and they feel like, wow, this is this is what I want to do mm -hmm. and train my people to do, mm -hmm. land in those places, and um, okay, let's let's just finish with one last thing. I'm going to jump. We've sort of talked about really the the ground level, the entry level, and a movement. If, if you don't do it at that level, you'll never see movement. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to know what to do on Monday morning. That's right. But what is in your heart, mm -hmm. as we dive in and, and just do these things and train others, what do you think, what does it look like when there's no place left mm -hmm. across, across the US? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what's on your heart for that? Mm -hmm. um, well, Malachi 1.11 um, is, a vision verse that was passed on to me from a mentor where uh, uh, God said that my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense worshipers will be raised up for my name will be great among the nations and so I think that's a promise that we're clinging to that God God's gonna be Jesus gonna be worshiped everywhere it's something that he is doing and so as we've stepped out in obedience we're watching him transform lives and uh, and then neighborhoods and then cities. And so when you start to see that happen, um, it, it, it fills your heart with a passion to see God's glory multiplied as his kingdom expands. And so then you gotta look up you know, at uh, other cities and we're starting to look at where are the gaps at. You know, where there's tons of unreached people groups and tons of lostness here in, our, in, our, in North America. And so um, we're praying that God will lead us to people that he's stirring in their hearts for movement. And uh, then we come in and, and we serve them with training and we, we pray for them, we learn from what God's doing through them. So I think what's in my heart is I'm rejoicing 
at what I'm seeing God doing, but then when I look up and see in other cities, it's like my heart's breaking and I, I wanna see God move there. And uh, I believe that the people he wants to use are there. Mm. And I believe a lot of them don't yet know Jesus and we need to get the gospel to them and train them up. Well, Troy, thanks for sharing your mm. story with us. Uh, I think a lot of us can identify on the journey you've been on mm. and we can rejoice at what God has mm. done. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it.